innovation. And innovation needs a stable, free economy. Emissions trading schemes are massive tax schemes that empower governments to the detriment of their very own citizens. They could very well create social democratic states that are intrinsically inefficient and invariably stifle their economies. Somewhat counterproductively, some of the currently implemented CO2 reducing policies are actually increasing CO2. Biofuels, such as those derived from palm oil and sugar cane, are meant to be grown to reduce petrol use in cars. This sounds all well and good in principle, but this procedure leads to essential food crops being replaced with cash crops. This in turn leads to the destruction of the rainforest, as land is cleared both for the biofuel cash crop and for food. Destruction of the rainforest leads to the release of CO2 and damages local self-sustainability. The virgin rainforest of Borneo, it has stood for thousands of years. But it's being destroyed at a rate said to be unparalleled in human history. It's disappearing under a two-pronged onslaught from logging and the proliferation of palm oil plantations. In addition, emissions trading will damage industry in many ways. Carbon-dependent industries, such as power generators, aluminium smelters and the mining companies will be particularly affected. It will heavily tax them, create market uncertainty and thus also devalue them further. This devaluation will drop their credit ratings and likely make them go either bankrupt or at least overseas. Countries like India and China have stated many times that they will not match US environmental goals in order to protect their own economies. They would thus be the beneficiaries of our outsourcing loss. If Australia goes ahead with its emissions trading scheme, it would spend about 50 billion Australian dollars by 2020. This would lead to an inconsequential 10% cut in Australian emissions. All of the activities about mitigating carbon dioxide, which is not a pollutant, are pointless, very expensive, and completely ineffective. So with so high a cost, and so little a benefit, does the precautionary principle of better safe than sorry seem a viable option? Even if you believe in man-made global warming, are phenomenally expensive schemes to reduce CO2 emissions the best way to deal with it? Within these last 19 months, at least 45 satellites have circled the Earth. Tyrus satellites have given us unprecedented warnings of hurricanes and storms and will do the same for forest fires and icebergs. The beauty of man is our adaptability. Where there is a will, there is often a way. Energy production is the foundation of modern civilization. Without cheap energy, we can kiss our prosperous lifestyles goodbye. So with all this ingenuity, perhaps we should be able to kick old school, dirty coal and oil out the door. It's time to herald in a cleaner, greener world powered by wind and by solar. Our human ingenuity will no doubt give us limitless green energy one day. But that day is not today. Renewable alternatives to fossil fuel burning are not yet available. There are no cheap technologies to replace coal. Nuclear could do the job, and it's high time we pulled our heads out of the sand, don't believe the hype, and actually consider it seriously. It seems to me that if A, you believe in man-made global warming, and B, you want to tackle it seriously, you really should be embracing nuclear power. However, I digress. The point is, renewables can't replace coal. Coal is not only very cheap, but also extremely reliable. Solar needs the sun, wind needs the wind, and whilst coal can run 24-7, they only run intermittently. As for clean coal, it's a great concept, but presently just a pipe dream. It won't realistically be on the horizon for decades to come. If there were cleaner, greener, and at least barely economic alternatives to coal, we would use them in a flash. Unfortunately, they haven't been invented yet. So for the foreseeable future, coal will be there making our lives better until a viable alternative is invented to perhaps replace it. The global warming debate, like its subject matter, the globe, is a hugely complex affair. 
But here are a few take-home points that may be food for thought when considering whether man-made CO2 is a serious problem or not. Global warming did not start in the last century, as we're often told, but hundreds of years earlier, before any industrialization. CO2 is thus very unlikely the driver of warming. The obvious cause of this warming is also the probable one. It's the sun, with the added effect of the oceans, not CO2. Warming is good, by the way. Not bad as the press may lead you to believe. Warming feeds the planet and aids biodiversity. Science revolves around hypotheses and supporting evidence. When it comes to CO2, there is very little of that. 50 billion American dollars have been spent since the 90s looking for CO2 warming, without hardly any success. The argument for it largely centers on non-transparent, rarely published climate models. These models have neither back-tested to historical data very well, nor predicted the last 10 years of cooling. They blame CO2, but can we really trust them? They will, no doubt, improve in time, but currently they must be taken with a large pinch of salt. It is often better to be safe than sorry. So why don't we take precautions against the chance that CO2 is the problem? However, the costs are so great that it will kill the world's poor and cripple the Western economies with very little temperature reduction. CO2 gets such a bad name, unjustly so. It is not a pollutant at all. It is actually a vital element of the atmosphere and an important fertilizer that has improved global crop yields by 15% since the 50s. Surely we should be producing more, not less of it. The church of global warming is about faith, not debate. Unquestioning faith in man-made, CO2-driven global warming. Well, it should not be a matter of faith, but of open debate. Currently, the debate is slowly rising to the fore, which is certainly a good thing, as the social and economic impact of global warming prevention is massive. Naturally, many people are now ambivalent towards the global warming debate, a natural and reasonable apathy that comes from media overexposure. However, if pressed, many people would show concern for the topic. Is the planet dying? Can I do something about it? The fact that we are in a global credit crunch and people's livelihoods are being pulled out from under them as we speak has really taken the focus away from global warming. This is a long-term, somewhat intangible concept, thus not as immediately important to us. However, our politicians are still set on a course to further cripple our economies with anti-global warming emissions trading schemes. Electricity rates would necessarily skyrocket. Is this wise in a climate of economic recession? Well, if we are destroying our planet, probably yes, as this takes precedence over our current economic crisis. But if CO2 isn't a problem, which is the far more likely situation, stop now. Spend our money on improving lives, not harming them. There is no catastrophic global warming on the foreseeable horizon. Invest in green technologies? Absolutely. Reduce our reliance on fossil fuels? Definitely. But don't cripple the world's economy with massive carbon taxes based on unsubstantiated science. Promote free trade and thus aid universal economic growth. This development is the real way we can not only improve all our lives, but also, somewhat ironically, ultimately obtain our common goal of minimizing our impact on the planet.